Last unit, you were introduced to types of compounds, but all we did was name them. Um, we had ionic, covalent, and acids. Now, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to put acids away. They have their own unit in April, so no acids. Um, but covalence and ionics have a bunch of comparative chemistry that I want you to know. Um, those of y'all at home, they've already copied this screen. So go ahead and pause the video. Now, I've given you kind of a thick packet. All right, so if you're at home, make sure you get your packet. Um, the reason it's semi-thick is because when you get back in January from Christmas, um, there's pages in here that we'll still be using. So don't lose your packet, please. It goes this unit and into next unit. Then I also gave you a singular sheet um, that you can actually pause again if you just want to grab it. But um, the singular sheet was supposed to be in the packet. I realized it wasn't, so sorry. But, um, all of that stuff is important. So my big focus today is for you to know the differences between ionics and covalence. But before we do that, there it goes. Um, you don't need to copy this. This is what's on that single sheet. So look at the single sheet that I handed out to you. Again. And um, this is the comparison. Like if we were to draw a Venn diagram of ionics and covalence, this would be the stuff in the very middle. All right. This is what they have in common. So let's go over it. Um, first off, uh, why, do, why do bonds form? We already went over that when we introduced nomenclature. Um, but remember, the whole reason that an atom and another atom will form a compound is to become stable, right? One of them is usually trying to get rid of electrons. The other one's trying to gain electrons um, in some form or another. And they satisfy their octet to become more stable and form a compound. And when they become more stable, that automatically lowers the amount of energy available, right? Remember, I described items that are trying to get their octet as really, really crazy trying to go and find a place to gain or lose electrons. Once they do it, the amount of energy that they have, it goes down, their potential energy. This also mentions that compounds are usually neutral. I say usually because there's exceptions to all my rules, but um, they're usually neutral, meaning any charge that you use to help you build a compound goes away once it's built. Like for ionics, for example, you're used to like, oh, this is plus three minus, or plus two minus three. I'm going to bond them and crisscross or whatever. That's great. The charges helped you do stuff. But when formed, the compounds are usually neutral. The other thing that's on that screen talks about bond strength. Another comparison that ionics and covalents have. And it states that the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. And let's look at why that is. Let's pretend that my hands are atoms that want to bond together. And this ruler is the bond that's going to do it. If I take the two atoms and I bond it together with a short bond, see how tiny the distance is between my hands? And now I try to break the ruler. It's very difficult to do. I mean, I'm obviously the strongest person in the room and I can't do it. When my hands are this close together, even if I try, I'm not able to break the ruler. But if I widen my grip, if I make the distance between the two bonds be a lot larger, you'll notice that I'm able to easily bow the ruler to the point where if I just use a little bit of my angry teacher strength, I could snap it in half. The longer the distance between the two atoms, the weaker that bond's going to be. And that's true for all types of compounds. So those are my few similarities. But your biggest mission during this unit is going to be to tell the difference. Because there's a lot of differences, as your opening slide explains. And uh, my questions can be kind of tricky sometimes on... Uh, 
differentiating. You ready? Featherstone. That's right. You stole it from Because you got skipped and you felt hated. It was Aspen's idea. <laughs> Ionic compounds are denoted by cations and anions, right? That's not new news for you. You know that all of the elements on the left, all the metals are cations. All of the elements to the right of the zigzag, the nonmetals, um, are anions. And a metal to a nonmetal or a cation to an anion is ion. We went over that last unit while you were naming these things. But let's look at how they bond. Now, have your writing utensil up. Like if I did that whole ruler bend thing and you didn't elaborate in your notes at all, you can write all over those pages. Then you're not being a very good college student. All right, so have your writing utensil up. Draw a couple atoms with me. Here's the nucleus of one atom which is positive. Here's the nucleus of another atom, which is positive. How do I know that the nucleus, the nucleus is always positive? What? What's inside the nucleus? Protons. All right, there's, pro there's neutrons also, but neutrons have no charge. So the nucleus is always positive. That's old news. Where are the electrons floating around in? Orbitals. Let's draw, let's draw a couple orbitals. All right, couple standard atoms. If it's ionic, one of these would be metal and the other would be non-metal. That's obvious. What I want to ask is this question. If this atom and this atom were going to collide with each other, what type of particle would interact first? What would hit what? The electrons, right? If they went near one another, the electrons are the first items on each, on each atom that would interact. What happens if you take the negative side of a magnet and put it towards the negative side of another magnet? They push away, they repel. So how does this happen then? If I'm telling you that they are going to bond together, the metal with the non-metal to be ionic, but the outer layers hate each other, how do they connect? Because there is a positive, right? I want you to uh, absorb what I'm about to say and then write it in your own words. Understand it and then write it. Here's what's true. The attraction between this electron and that and those protons is stronger than the repulsion between that electron and this one. Listen again. The attraction between this electron and that positive nucleus is stronger than the repulsion between these two valence electrons. The attraction between the electron and that positive nucleus is a stronger force than the electron repulsion. If you're struggling with a word somewhere in there in your own words, you can talk to a neighbor. So what happens when they get there? How does the bond actually take place? Well, it's something that you've seen before because I introduced it with nomenclature. Look here.
let me show you what they're looking at. Do you recognize that process? We did an exercise together before we started crisscrossing numbers that moved valence electrons from one atom to another with the idea of making the octet happy everywhere. Now, this is a simple one because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. But of course, if it was magnesium chloride, it would require two chlorines. And you can figure that out with oxidation states. But this is showing that process of donating electrons from one atom to another. And it's always the metal that donates the electron to the nonmetal. Also notice that the charges don't appear on the circles until the electrons have moved because that's when they become charged is when those electrons have moved around. So donation is a key word in ionic descriptions. Electrons being donated, that'll be a lot different than when we look at the covalence here in a few minutes. Once they're bonded, we've got some vocab, which lots and lots of vocab today, sorry. But we've uh, got vocab to describe the structure and we call ionics crystal lattice. What's a lattice, do you know? You might have one in your backyard. Why are you all talking to your breath? That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. It's kind of like a crisscross of wood, like vines sometimes grow up it, or maybe you sneak down it out of your bedroom window at night. Um, yeah, a lattice is a crisscrossing structure. And what I want you to know is that when the ions all start forming together to form a, a larger crystal, because again, crystal is what we can use. Like, for example, if we wanted to look at that NaCl table salt, that was on the, uh, the image, the animation a moment ago. Here's what it would kind of look like if you take my bad drawing for truth. But every one of these lattice points, they call, would be a different one of the ions. Like maybe this would be a sodium, and then there would be a chlorine. And then there would be a sodium, and there would be a chlorine. And it builds this kind of rigid structure when all of the ions start bonding together. And we call it a, a crystal lattice. But this only describes ionics, right? That's the big thing is differentiating the ionic vocab from the covalent. So you can have a crystal of salt, which kind of makes sense. You might have even used that phrase. How often, though, do you see a crystal of salt by itself? One crystal. Does it usually have friends or is it usually solo? It usually has friends, right? It's hard to isolate a singular crystal of table salt. <clears throat> even though that's true, You've learned when we did our nomenclature that ionics are always simplified, right? If you look at fact four up there, that ionics are always shown in the simplest ratio. So let's say that you had a thousand. That you had a thousand crystals of sugar. Could you do this? Could you write it like that? You can't because we know from our ionic nomenclature that ionics are always written in the smallest, most reduced ratio. So this would be impossible. How could I show there were a thousand? Anybody know? It would be a coefficient is what we call it. Now you're not charged for that word yet. That's a second semester idea. 
but you would say, all right, well, there are a thousand NaCLs. But the ratio in the compound, in the formula, would stay one to one because that's what the octet rule requires. The other stuff listed there are just physical properties. We're actually going to test some of them in lab um, later this week or maybe Monday. I'm not sure which lab I'm doing when. But um, you'll try to like melt salt. Have you ever tried to melt salt? Do you know what happens if you pour table salt directly on the stove? What does it do? It doesn't melt. It it burns. Yeah, it just turns black and starts smoking. Why? Because salt, table salt, has a very high melting point. It does. It's so hard to melt salt because it's really hard to break this crystal lattice and make it start to melt. So it just lights on fire. But well, it depends on which salt you're talking about. I don't have table salts off the top of my head, but I'm glad you asked that. Keep in mind that even though I'm really kicking NaCl around on these examples, that there are thousands of types of ionic compounds, and these facts are true for all of them. So if it's a metal to a non-metal, then these are the, descript the descriptors that you're looking for. Yeah, halfway done-ish. Let's switch to the other guy. Covalence. Hey, a new bolded word. Covalence don't donate electrons. Let's take a look at what they do. You'll notice in this animation that there's not a donation. Instead, both of the non-metals keep full possession of their own electrons. It's just a sharing of electrons that create the covalent bond. So the word donation does not apply to covalence. All right, covalence is only described as a sharing of electrons. If I were to ask you what's the opposite of crystal structure, which of course we use crystal to describe ionics, your answer would be molecule. Covalent compounds are described as molecules. So if that's true, could you have a molecule of salt? Are we all so tired? Are we recovered from our break? My alarm was rough this morning. Um, I got up at 2 a.m. because I heard my dog sneezing out. Sorry, now you can see your story. I heard my dog sneezing at 2 a.m. last night, and I just went to go check to make sure it wasn't sneezing at Robert's or whatever, and all the lights were on upstairs. And I'd already told my daughters good night. I went upstairs. Have you ever played Exploding Kittens? Y'all like, Exploding Kittens is a great game. I'll play Exploding Kittens. But I went up there, and they're just sitting there playing. They were supposed to smile at me. Like, hey, Dad. <laughs> Why are y'all up? Like, vacation. So, <laughs> anyways, everybody went to school today, though. So that's good. Okay. Well, wake up. I'm trying to finish. I'm sorry. Um, no, you could not have a molecule of salt because salt is ionic, and ionics are not described with that term. Let's draw a card on this one. It'll make somebody answer. Here's a new question. Let's go over to cluster three. Ooh, it's a full cluster. And talk to C. Five. Hey, three, five. Could you have, it's you, Aiden. Could you have a molecule of water? Regard, despite anything you've heard in your life and what I'm going over, is it possible to have a molecule of water? Sorry? The guess is yes. Do you agree or disagree? Some of y'all are squinting and, and here, I mean, look, look, look. I'm asking, can you have a molecule of water? What your brain needs to go is say is, okay, well, molecules are covalent. Is it covalent? Hydrogen is a nonmetal. It's the only nonmetal to the left of the zigzag. Oxygen is nonmetal. Nonmetal to a nonmetal. Covalent. Covalents are molecules. Yes. You can have a molecule of water. Can you have a crystal of water? 
No, because you only use crystals to describe ionics. Do you see the types of questions you're going to run into? All right. Well, let's murky up the water a little bit. Let's say that when y'all came in today, I had a delicious pizza pie. And you could smell that pizza. And man, you really, really wanted some. And you asked nicely for some. And I said, sure. I was in a really good mood. So I gave you half of the pizza. That was really nice of me, right? I shared it with you, yeah? But let's rewind. Let's say y'all came in and you smelt the delicious pizza. And you begged for some of it. And I gave you one slice. And I kept the other seven for myself. Did I share with you? I did. I shared with you. I gave you a slice of pizza. But I didn't share it equally. My point is, is that there's more than one way to share. And that's what this vocab refers to. Write this down. If a covalent compound is polar, that is unequal sharing. Therefore, if it's nonpolar, that'll be equal sharing. Do you see how if you didn't study these words and then you had to guess that you'd probably guess them backwards? So be careful. And if you're like, oh, they do that just to make it hard. Here's why the non is not connected to the un. What this is referring to is whether or not there's a pull on the compound. If something has a pull on it, it means that one of the atoms in the bond is pulling harder on the electrons that are being shared than the other ones. Like for example, imagine that I want to bond my elbows together, all right? And my hands are the electrons. So I'm going to bond this nonmetal to this nonmetal, and here's the electrons that they're going to share. If once they share, this nonmetal does have a pull on it, it's going to pull. Therefore, it's eating a lot more of the pizza than this one over here is. But if it doesn't have a pull, then when this one bonds to this one and now they share, that would be nonpolar, equal. Now, if you're wondering, well, how do you know if there's a pole or not? That's my last point of the day of that yellow highlighter. So we're gonna get there. Uh, but that's the what behind the idea. Unlike ionics, covalents do not have to reduce their numbers. You know this because when we did covalent nomenclature, the monodiatride, tetrapenta, blah, 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 you never looked at whether or not the subscripts needed to be reduced, right? Like if it was a tetrahexa, which would be four and six, you didn't build the compound and then chop the numbers in half, right? That was never a part of covalent, which is why this next fact states that... Um, Covalence can be unreduced. What's the formula for glucose? Nobody knows glucose? Y'all do not. I should not record in this class. The other classes talk to me. Thank you. That's right. It's C6H12O6. Remember photosynthesis last year? You studied it. Is that a crystal or a molecule? No reason to guess. I, every class, I just hear different things yelled out. You're just asking yourself, is it metals and non-metals, which would be a crystal, or is it all non-metals, which would be a molecule? What is it? It's a molecule. Non-metal, 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 molecular. Do you see how glucose is unreduced? That's the only reason it gets to stay unreduced is because it's a molecule. But if this was ionic, it would automatically become CH2O because they can all be divided by six because ionics automatically reduce their subscripts. Covalents don't. 
So if it's molecular, you can stay like this. You're not writing on aspirin. You're just fixing this jacket. Okay. Underline the word diatomics. This is a really big one. Here's the definition to add. Diatomics are elements that cannot exist alone. Diatomics are elements that cannot exist alone. And they're all non-metal. <laughs> if you look at the periodic table, there's over a hundred elements, yeah? Most of them can exist a lot. There's only seven that can't. There's seven elements on the table that cannot ever be all by themselves. Now, I'm going to show you what that means, but first, you need to know what they are. Here's the trick to know your diatomics. It's Brinkelhoff. Say Brinkelhoff. It feels good. Brinkelhoff. Ah, uh, didn't that feel amazing? Here's how you spell Brinkelhoff. Do it with me. Inside the cheat of Brinkelhoff are the seven elements that can't exist alone. You can find them easy on the table, too, because all of them except hydrogen are touching each other. It's like an upside-down L starting at nitrogen. Um, but anyways, just use Brinkelhoff. But again, these elements can never be solo. For example, what are you breathing right now? Oxygen, do, do you know how to write oxygen? Like if I had an oxygen tank, what would be written on the, on the label? It would say what's inside. All that's in there is oxygen. But what would the label say? It does. So too. That's oxygen. Why? Because oxygen's diatomic. Think about the word diatomic. Di for two. If any of these seven elements try to exist all by themselves, they will automatically bond to a copy of themselves in the form of a little tube. So if anyone ever just says, hey, that room's full of chlorine, then it's full of Cl2. But if they say the room is full of lithium, then it's full of just Li. Because remember, there's over 100 elements that are not diatomic. Don't go all too crazy and drop deuces everywhere, all right? Only those seven elements have this rule. Because in nature, if they're unbonded in this way, they become what's called a free radical, and they have all kinds of awful outcomes. And um, I mean, I could go into some of them, but a lot of them do things like hurt the ozone layer and stuff like that. But you won't be asked that question. Here, here's a question, though. Based on what is on this board, can that exist? Now it's water, so you're like, well, duh, of course it exists. But <gasps> oxygen's all by himself, right? Is he? No, he's bonded to H. All right. There's always a student that leaves the room, and they're like, well, from now on, that's how my water looks. No, 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 no. All right, that's hydrogen peroxide. That's way different than water, but. Um, it's only if it is blatantly by itself, one of those seven automatically gets the two. All right, last thing of a very long day. Let's go back to polar versus nonpolar. There's a cheat that you can use. 
Oh, I forgot to say something earlier. I'm a very bad teacher. Um, do me a favor. In your big packet, I'm on a tangent now. Find this. It's on um, page two. I believe it's the front of page two. They're looking at this page. Sorry, I didn't mean to get ahead of myself, but this is an important reference. You don't have to memorize any part of it. But um, it reiterates the whole idea of shorter bonds or stronger bonds. Like, I could ask you to compare um, HF to CF. I just chose the first two. But if you look at those two items, you'll see that the bond length of HF is much shorter than the bond length of CF, but you'll see that the bond energy of HF is greater because the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. Um, but the reason it's important for you to know this is here is because you might run into some Canvas questions that ask about specific bonds and you'll think, well, how do I know what the length is? I've given you a reference, right? So go and be ready to look it up if that happens. Anyway, go to the back of that sheet. Go to the back of that sheet. This weird periodic table is giving you electronegativity values of the elements. You know that word because when we study trends, I taught you that electronegativity is the, cra That's right. is the craving of electrons for an element. It increases right and up, which you can see fluorine is the highest on the, on the paper. Anyway, for us to tell whether something will be polar covalent or non-polar covalent, equal or unequal sharing, we can use these values. As the screen says, there's a range that you can look at. All right. So if you take, well, let me explain. If you're given two elements that are going to bond together, all you have to do is look up their electronegativity values on that sheet and find the difference. between them. Do absolute value. Don't get a negative number. But Find the absolute difference between the two items and see where they fall on the scale. If the difference between them is greater than 1.55, then it's ionic, an ionic bond. If the distance between them is in this range here, it's polar covalent. And then if it's smaller than 0.5, it's non-polar covalent, meaning equal sharing. So with that said, and again, you don't have to memorize anything on that sheet. I'll provide it to you. Let's do the first yellow highlighter one together, which is bromine. Now, I know it says Br2, but all I, do, all I have to do is say bromine, and it's automatically Br2 because bromine's diatomic. All right, so there's the Br2. But what it really looks like what it really looks like is that. All right, bromine bonded to bromine. Now there's some other bonding stuff that we're going to study about the shape of that um, later this week, but let's keep it simple. Find bromine on your electronegativity chart. What is his value? Say it again. 2.96. Which means this bromine is also 2.96. To find out what type of bond it is, you just subtract. Now, I know that there's an ionic range on there. Y'all, this thing that we're doing... You never have to use it for ionic because there's only one type of ionic. So metal bonded to non-metal, ionic. Don't mess with this. But polar versus non-polar is where you have to mess with this. What is 2.96 minus 2.96? It's zero. All right, good job. You probably had to use a calculator. What's the answer then? What type of bond is it? Non-polar covalent because it's less than point.
Do the other two. There's two more in yellow highlighter there. Analyze both of them. Gonna draw a card. Let's go talk to someone. Let's go over to cluster four and talk to seat three. Hey, four, three, it doesn't even count for your Aspen. Um, what about the um, SBCL? What was your final uh, answer? All right, so what was your, what did you decide it was? So, so you, you have the number. So now apply it to one of the ranges. Is it ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent? If it's 1.11. All right, so, so just look here. Is it bigger than 1.55 in the middle of those two numbers or smaller than 0.55? In the middle, so it is polar covalent. So polar covalent for this reason. What's that? What's the bottom one, anybody? Ionic, right? But again, we proved that it works, but if it is a metal with a non-metal, it's automatically ionic. So you don't have to use this new skill for ionic. Good job, y'all. Have a great day.